Okay, and let me share the screen. Okay. All right, this breakout session is going to be about the final settlement claims uh, from between the US and Mexico and uh, the discovery that we made of these uh, records in the National Archives too. These settlement claims uh, have occurred from Americans and Mexicans uh, from 1815 to 1949. And we happened across these uh, because an applicant to DAR said, oh, well, my grandmother got money from the Mexican government and we went looking for the records. The records are 1300 linear feet divided into 202 sections and have a whole lot of different indices in it. Um, so there are main three kinds of these records. There's 77 boxes of index cards and those are a card for every claimant between 1815 and 1923, I think, which was their agreed to end of uh, making the claims. There are a whole set of boxes, about 1,500 boxes, that are agency or attorney's files. And these are stored by number. And then a group of the claims, about a little less than 500 claims that were mostly for stolen cattle and stolen uh, horses and whatever, were put together in a single case and they have a court case and they have a memorial set of volumes. Um, there are actually 41 volumes of transcribed uh, material that include depositions, uh, proofs of lineages and things like that. And I'm gonna talk mostly about that and the agency file and what we've done to, to try to make this data become available. This Texas cattle claim cat started in uh, 1872 when uh, Ulysses Grant and Congress got tired of getting all of these letters from Texas cattle rangers saying, somebody came from Mexico, stole my cattle and took it back across the border and I can't get anything from it. They didn't handle any of the cases in an expedited fashion and because the commissions kept starting and ending and finally, in about 1923, the US and Mexico uh, signed a treaty and decided that they would then handle the cattle claims in one combined case and uh, sort everything out and that the US would handle their side and the Mexicans would handle their side. So when they agreed to this, they kept uh, delaying and delaying and delaying. And finally, in 1934, they said, we really need to solve this. And so they opened it up and said, uh, and in fact, that the uh, attorneys of the time were like uh, ambulance chasers. They would publish in the newspapers the list of the original 1872 or 73 complainants and say, are you related to these people? We can get you money. And uh, if you were descended from any of those people, all you had to do is prove the descent to it, birth, marriage, death records, family Bibles, whatever you had, and prove that you were a US citizen. The case was finally settled in 1947 and they actually did pay out uh, money. Uh, the person that we originally were looking for actually got $130. Um, and that after this, they filed all of this State Department records into the archives and then forgot about them. So why they're important is you can get birth and marriage and death record proofs for the, for the continuing claimants clear from 1938 all the way back to the original claimant. And then the original claimant had his original deposition in which case he said when and where he was born, um, which is in the early 1800s in most cases. And uh, the states that we found people being born in were you know, New England states, Southern states, because everybody came to Texas from somewhere. And some of these records don't exist anywhere else except in these depositions. Um, in the depositions we and the proofs, we found maiden names of some of the claimants were actually women ranchers. Um, we found relationships uh, and you can, if you connect to one, 
perhaps find uh, the brothers or the sisters who also had claims and uh, be able to expand your research to be able to connect it. We have actually done applications using this data at, in, uh, for DAR, and it has been accepted as valid data by the genealogists at DAR. So it's uh, valid stuff to do. The Texas Society has selected a portion of these, the 34,000 pages that are the what they call the memorial or the listing for the entire court case. Um, and they are going to scan this data and it will then be available in the NARA catalog and on the DAR website, the URL is TBD at the time. Uh, the index that we have created um, includes the primary claimant, any of spouses or immediate family, or if they died in test state, who they um, gave their stuff to. And um, uh, that, that data will be done in the future. Uh, we're working on the contract now, and since COVID has closed everything, we're not sure when we'll be able to actually do the scanning and be able to have, make that data available. The index um, is to be completed this month. I'm in the final typo checking of it. And as soon as that comes uh, is available, it will go both to NARA and be on their catalog and on a TBD uh, resource tab in the DAR website. Uh, the digitization is in what they call the Memorial Volume 7 through 48 for this court case. Um, it is a carbon onion skin typewritten transcription of all of the data, the original uh, app, uh, depositions from the original claimants that were taken in 1872 and 73, and then all of the uh, data that was provided by any of the descendants because they wanted to continue the claim. It includes transcribed Bible records, transcribed obituaries, uh, transcribed newspapers, depositions by the family and the neighbors who answered the questions and provided these records. In some cases, this transcription is the only thing the original record, like the newspaper clipping or whatever, no longer survive. Um, and then these papers were put in. Now, in addition, our index will cover a second portion, which is for all of the uh, potential claimants for whom they could not find a descendant or who failed to make the filing deadline and so weren't included in the court case. In that case, the index will point you to this specific box where their attorney file is. And in many cases, those attorney files are much more complete than what got put into the court case. There's more documentation in it but there are 1500 boxes of that and there's no way we can afford to scan all of it. So we're mainly just going to scan the court case, but the index will point you to it so that you or someone else can actually go to the archives and find that data. Now in the court case, the data for each claimant is done in alphabetical order and they're, each one is headed by these pink uh, pages which give the original uh, attorney's number, their original docket number, because all of these came from separate cases that were pulled into one. It gives the name of the original claimant and it gives all of the continuing claimants, the children, grandchildren, in many cases, great-grandchildren who are continuing this original case. And as you'll notice, it gives for every female, if they married, it gives her husband's name. So this is a way to connect the families. That's what makes this data so uh, important. Uh, some of the data that's in here, this is the uh, transcribed deposition of an original claimant. He happens, Francis Winans happens to be the oldest one that we found in these documents. And it says he's an American citizen. It says where he's born in 1790 in you know, Elizabethtown, New Jersey, that he moved to Illinois, gives who he married, and when he, you know, was married, um, it gives the census where he was, 
and the marriage affidavits and whatever they were doing it um, from this. They had the following children. It tells when they moved, it tells their children's marriage um, and it tracks them. So uh, in one of the records, Francis Wynan, uh, Bible record or whatever that, that's actually included with these, um, he says his father is a, a revolutionary patriot. He has not been used yet. He is not proved. We actually have found descendant who wants now to use this data to prove a new patriot. Hamilton Bennett was the guy we originally went looking for um, because it was his descendant who actually had the um, uh, money paid out to them. And this is a, his original deposition uh, in, that was done in 1873 in the Frio County Court. And it says, I'm born in 1811. I'm 62 years old. I was born in Botadot County, Virginia. And I've lived in Leona, Frio County for 15 years. It goes on in the depositions and uh, records to that to show when and where he was married. Here's his deposition. There are uh, transcribed uh, deeds. There are, oh, in this case, this was a, a, a descendant of his who happened to live in Georgia or uh, in Jones County, or no, Jones County, Mississippi. And she wanted to be part of this case. And in the record she had, she had a newspaper clipping that had been passed down in her family that gives the death of Hamilton Bennett. It was from a newspaper in, uh, in Texas and said newspaper no longer exists anywhere, digitally microfilmed or in paper copy. This is probably the only place you will find this data. Um, so this is one of the reasons we've done it. Here again, here's another obituary. Um, now the obituary, uh, when she died, it's from a newspaper that was in Missouri, but because they were trying to prove the lineage, they pulled all of these different um, uh, obituaries. And in this case, her birth date, 1780 in Juniata County, uh, Pennsylvania, and you can see where they moved and everything else, which will give you the migration of the families. Um, they copied and transcribed family Bible records. Normally, DAR does not take Bible records that do not have either a copyright date or that, um, you know, if the handwriting is all the same or anything else. But since this was transcribed into a legal court document, it is acceptable to the G DAR genies, um, which is really good. And in, this is one of the son's Bibles. And so, again, we're able to connect families with birth dates in states long before they kept birth records. Um, again, here's another Bible record and they tried to transcribe it pretty much similarly to the way it, it uh, was contained in the record. Uh, someone had a family record and that they had put in. And again, this is provided as part of the court case and therefore is a, uh, uh, an acceptable uh, set of documentation. And again, you can, can, can look at where everyone was born and actually follow this family as they migrated from one place to another and ended up in Texas. Um, this is a sample of what the index pages will look like. We have it uh, and we have gone through the records. It is not an every name index. There are depositions that are given by some of the vaqueros and the workers of the family, and we have not gotten to that yet. We are trying to get the majority of the data that we could get in a short period of time. But we do have for each of the uh, original claimants, if they had a spouse listed in any of this stuff, we have entered in both for the spouse um, under the maiden name, we have listed any of the immediate children if they were also co-claimants on this. And in addition, uh, if there were additional spellings or uh, 
sometimes like this guy, uh, James Carr, sometimes he was James C. Carr, sometimes he was James B. Carr, we've tried to do that. What we have done in this index is put, this is one of the 41 volumes of material. So we have given the volume and the page numbers of all of the data for that individual. In some cases, you can see there's like 88 pages of data here. Um, in one case, we have one family of uh, the Francis Winan ones. There are 834 pages of transcribed family data in that. Now, what we also did is if we could identify their attorney, uh, the agency, we've also given the, the uh, number that you can then go ahead and, and with this number in the National Archives, call forth the box of that agency box and the agency number to give it. If, however, the attorney uh, took out their file and forgot to refile it, it will say missing. That means there is no attorney's file. All you will have is actually the data that is in the court case. But in this case, he's got, you know, 20 or 30 pages that might have everything you need. We did go ahead and list the spouses where we could. Um, and you'll see in some cases, we weren't quite sure of the name, but we put as close as we could get it. If they had a, a relationship that we could determine, we put that. So in this case, uh, Giles C Carter's sister is Laura Carter Jones. She's also listed uh, because the Joneses filed this. Um, right now, this is about 48 pages worth of it. And when we get to the end of this, um, if you actually have, besides questions, if you would like uh, and you have a name, I will be more than happy to look it up for you to see what it is. Now, these volumes, this amount of data, if you add up all of these pages through here, amount to the 34,000 or 35,000 pages that the DAR will scan and make available. Like I say, we're still working on the contract for it. Um, and that's what I have for my presentation. So um, if you'd like now, um, I'm, I'll be glad to answer any questions or perhaps look up a name for you. Let me unmute everybody. I think I have unmuted, we'll see. If not, unmute yourself. Are there any questions? I have a question. Yes, Monica. I, um, I when you were giving your introduction earlier, mm -hmm. I didn't catch anything because I was distracted by my own introduction plans. So what is this an index of? I just okay. saw the one that says cattle claims, but it's right. other things too, right? Um, it is, this is in the location of the uh, record group 76, which is uh, boundary claims and disputes between the US and foreign countries. And this has to do with Mexico. And the mm -hmm. specific set of records that we're looking at are claims to and from Americans and Mexicans against each other's um, okay. Governments. And what happened is the majority of them uh, uh, were uh, in a time period, especially just following the Civil War, where uh, uh, there was a Mexican general whose name is Cortina, I think. And he used, they used to come across and they would uh, raid and, and get cattle and horses and stuff and go back across the Rio Grande and to Mexico. Mm -hmm and the people couldn't get their stuff. And so they made, kept making complaints to the US government saying, you know, they stole my cattle. I need, you know, somebody's got to pay for this. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't handle it well. And finally in about 1923, they filed, they, they did a, uh, uh, a treaty with Mexico. And in that treaty, they agreed that, that they would put stuff together. And so about 460, 480 separate cattle claims were pulled together into one big court case. 
And that's what these memorial volumes are, the 34,000 pages of all the transcribed stuff. And the reason being that they allowed the descendants, if they could prove that they were US citizens, which was interesting because before 1922, if an American woman married a non-citizen, no she longer lost citizen. her citizen, yeah, exactly. yep. uh, and had to reapply. And mm -hmm. so um, this data, if you look at the original depositions that were taken in 1872 and 1873, the original claimants didn't always originate in Texas. They came from other places like mm -hmm. the 83-year-old the who had been born in Elizabethtown, New Jersey in 1790, um, the 70- or 62-year-old who was born in Virginia in Bottendock County in 1811. And so this tracks, and you can find it has their marriages and their children and all of this. And since it's a court documentation, this is legal. And a lot mm -hmm. of those places, those records don't exist anymore. And so mm -hmm. we're trying to put in the index will be up shortly um, and we'll be announcing that shortly, I think, um, on the DAR website and we will give a copy to, to the National Archives when they get it on their catalog, I won't, I, I, I won't know. Um, and we're trying to put the index to which volume and pages and which box the court case data mm -hmm. is in and also, if there's an additional attorney's file, what box so that you can go and request it off the shelf at the National Archives to see what extra data might be in it. We are not planning on scanning any of the um, attorney's files because it's just too voluminous. There, it would cost yeah. far too much money. Um, so the Texas Society will is now in the process of trying to uh, write a contract with a company to go in and scan the 34,000 onion skin tripe written pages. Uh, once that is done, that data will be available through the National Archives catalog and through the DAR website. And is there a place where we can read more about this project? Um, no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yeah, we're, ho we're hoping to, I'm hoping to put together a magazine article for NGS or, you know, one of the other magazines to put it. But right Great. now, uh, since we don't have the contract for the scanning and some of the other, you know, our dates and places are still a little TBD. Mm -hmm. But I'm so excited about this data that we just happened upon that I wanted yeah. to go ahead and, and make it, you know, announce it. Um, and hopefully I won't get into trouble for it. Uh, the index, this index has been done by two of us. It took us- I understand that, yes. Four, four <laughs> trips to DC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the last one I made uh, in February, right before they shut oh. everything down. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I'm in the process of typo checking it. And uh, hopefully uh, after our state convention next month, we may be able to, um, work to put it on the DAR website as a, you know, here's a new resource. Can't right. get to it yet, but at yeah. least here it is. Okay, that's hey, great. Hey, you have a question? I do, I didn't get to come in to the first of this, so I hope I'll be able to find the recording so I can see it from the beginning. Um, okay. So if we had ancestors that were here in Texas when it was a republic, Yep, I we might, might have, have a big chance at yep. finding something. All do right. you have a Do you have a name? Well, unfortunately, his name was John C. Burke. B U R K, sometimes with an E, sometimes yeah, not. Yeah, well, that spelling is optional all yeah. the time. Uh, let me see. Do I have a? I can't, can I tell if he was a? I have a Patrick Burke married to a Nancy Ryan, who has mm, from page 81 to 138 in volume 11. Now with that- Patrick that's... just does not sound like one of the family names. Okay. Um, I mean, now, his son's now, name was James. The, <laughs> so. uh, the second index I have, which I don't have a copy here uh, right in front of me, is we did discover when we started looking in the attorney's boxes that there were a bunch of them that had voluminous attorney files, 
but they aren't in the court case. So either okay. they missed the filing deadline or something else. And I'm not sure if I can go look that up. Um, hmm. Hang on, let me see if I can actually go look in this. And agency only. Oh, and I have done it by agency number. I don't have an alphabetical sort on it. So I'm just going okay, to well, it's look just through. good to know this is in the works. This is in the works. And that's not to say that this other Burke may not, it may be a, uh, <clears throat> a uh, relative and that there may be something in that relative's boxes that will, that will give you uh, some right. information. It could be a descendant on down the line mm -hmm. um, that I haven't, I don't remember right. that and, name. And we have not indexed all the descendants' names. We have yeah. only done the original claimants, their spouses, and immediate family that, that's in that because otherwise it would take us years to do that. So we figured at least we would do this piece and maybe in the next revision, we will start to put in all the <laughs> descendants. Um, we simply didn't have time. Are there any other questions? I'm, I have a question, but it's not about your project. So I don't wanna interfere with anybody else here. <laughs> Nobody else? Nobody else? Well, hang on. I, I haven't figured out how to stop the recording either. So this will be interesting. Oh, oh, here it is. Okay. Let me stop the recording then if we'll do that. Okay.